All right. So for everybody watching at home or watching this on tape delay, um, we are having our second uh, Frontier Forum as it relates to reopening. Um, we got a lot more questions. Uh, many of them are very similar um, to other ones. So we'll go through those and we'll go through, I actually pulled a lot of them that uh, answer questions that you all have. Um, I appreciate you joining us on a Sunday at one o'clock when, you know, normally if, if we didn't have this pandemic, there would be a preseason game or two on, uh, go Bills. Um, but before I start, I just wanted to mention a couple things. Um, it's very evident, and, and I agree with all of you, um, that we want our kids back in school, and we wish they could be. Um, I'm going to go through some survey results here shortly to show you how, how prevalent that really is. And I understand it's hard to keep up with everything that's going on and the constant changes, um, not just in the real world, but also here at Frontier. Um, we're reacting in real time to new information, um, your concerns, uh, you know, our limitations when it comes to space and staffing and things like that, and uh, the information we get. The survey information is, is a key part of that. Um, if, you, if you noticed, on Friday we posted um, documents for hybrid and virtual models. Um, are these final? Definitely not. Our awesome group of principals and the, the people in our curriculum office led by Assistant Superintendent Colleen Dugan have worked their tails off and will continue to do so um, well beyond the start of school to make all this happen. Um, is it perfect? Not at all. But we're going to do the best we can. And um, honestly, the, the best we can do. And if we are able to make everything perfect, which is impossible because nothing is ever perfect, um, it's still not going to be good enough for, for, for our, all of our students. Um, will virtual learning be better than it was last year? Most definitely. We're not starting from a, in the middle of a pandemic, shutting school down and what do we do now uh, phase. You know, there's been a lot of time and our teachers have been doing an unbelievable amount of training or so has our administrators. Um, but we're going to do the best we can with the guidelines we have um, as it relates to the pandemic and our and our staffing and, and space capabilities. And so if you, if you think it's hard to keep up with all the changes, I'm right there with you. Um, I get those I get the same questions at home and in, our, in my neighborhood that, uh, that you all have. So um, keep those things going and um, we'll, we'll make it happen. So let me jump into some survey results. Um, initially, we had 2,555 2, responses. Um, that's pretty good. That's really good because that covers almost 3,500 students. So the number of responses, you have a, extra responses in there um, for additional children. So you know, if, if you have more than one, like in my household, one response, but you have four students. So those kind of pieces are, are right on there. Um, based on the responses, we're looking at 20% of our student population, about 20% um, is not comfortable sending students back to school this fall. So that means most likely they're choosing a virtual model. And when we look at that data, we see that that works out. Now we are still missing about 1,100 students, uh, 1,100 to 1,200 students from that survey, but to have a over 70% survey return rate is um, it's not normal. Um, it's 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 beyond uh, what is typical. Um, again, 20% um, in a different question we asked about the two main options for learning. You know, the uh, virtual piece is, is between 15 to 20%, um, but that's also um, with some families that have multiple children and going to make different decisions for different children based on their individual needs. Um, we also asked a question and that will come up a little bit later as well on, you know, if were you in favor of ulting the start and end times for middle, elementary, and high school to provide additional uh, to provide additional social distancing, say that at five times fast on buses. And about 76% of people said they were in favor of that. So this week, uh, once we put out a survey, um, we're asking for commitments on two things, virtual learning and transportation. 
Um, and if you commit to virtual learning and commit to the transportation piece, um, please um, expect that to go through the end of January. Um, maybe we end up coming back sooner and maybe it's extended. But uh, based on the information we have now and uh, without a vaccine or, or, or other therapeutics out there that uh, greatly reduce the threat of COVID, um, we're doing the best we can uh, to do so. Uh, a couple other pieces, um, food service. Um, one question later in here, we'll ask about food service. And I'm gonna try to get through as many of these as I can. Uh, probably spend a, more than an hour plus, and then we'll do a follow-up tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. for the third one. Uh, we did ask parents, if your child or children had to complete a portion of the weekly instructional instruction virtually, what technology would you require the district to provide? About a little more than half said they don't need any, they're all set. So that tells us, you know, some we need to get out some devices. And we handed out well over 700 last year, and they're still out. And also uh, about 4%, 4.5% of those that responded said Wi Fi is also an issue. Um, so I'll dive into the Chromebook piece and the device access in a question very shortly, uh, but I'm just kind of setting the tone here so you can understand what the survey results say. Um, the thing that concerns me most um, is that nearly 45% of our responses um, said yes to this question, and that being, did your family experience an increase in social emotional difficulties? Um, examples such as anxiety, depression, aggressive behaviors during this time. Um, we are in a very difficult time, all of us. So at Frontier, we're gonna do everything we can to create a new normal while we're in this to help our community and especially our students um, to deal with this. Um, we are actually are hiring a social worker this week. Uh, we're gonna be in the process of hiring a, a behavior specialist to expand those pieces. Um, so there's a lot of things we've been doing over the last two years and we're gonna continue doing so. Um, the best thing we could do is have everybody in school every day, um, but we don't have the capacity uh, from a social distancing standpoint, building wise, or a staffing capacity to do so. Um, so we're gonna do the best we can with what we have. Um, if the district goes to a hybrid model, would you be interested in before or after school? About 16% of people said yes. And I'll, I'll tackle that a little bit more, so a few more specifics on that um, going forward. But that's basically the general um, results from the survey. And uh, so let's let's jump into these into these pieces and uh, see what we can do. So there might be some questions that sound similar, but I wanna make sure I hit as many of these pieces as possible. The hybrid versus remote seem to be the hot topic. So we'll tackle that one first and we'll get going. Um, so Linda asks, when choosing a hybrid plan versus a remote virtual plan, is there a difference between the amount of instruction, amount of curriculum covered, and or the quality of education a student will receive? Well, the quality of education piece, it's plain and simple. In school is gonna be better um, than anything we do virtually. Now for some students, some students will sell in a virtual environment um, because they can go at their own pace and move. But I can tell you our teachers are absolutely awesome. Um, it would, we will be better off than we were uh, in March when we were you know, all surprised by the closings and such. Um, it's not necessarily the, the amount of instruction, the same level of expectation will be there. And it's really about mastering the material and application of the material. So as a former science teacher, you know, we're gonna make sure we get through all the curriculum, but make sure our students work to master that curriculum. And if some students can master faster, then they can go faster. If it takes some students longer, depending on the topic, depending on the issue, then we need to make sure. So it will look different, um, hybrid, um, the virtual, the, the difficulty with virtual is you don't have that in-person connection. So that definitely, um, and I hope that helps a little bit um, I don't think we can give specific specifics just because it really is going to be up to every individual teacher with working with every individual student to find out what they need.
but the expectation, whether it's hybrid, remote, virtual, is going to be the same. Um, let's master the learning um, so that we get a good foundation and are able to learn and grow appropriately at the grade level we're at and accelerate as much as the child can. So uh, can you explain further the synchronous and asynchronous learning? So synchronous learning, this is the problem with education. We tend to use a lot of words nobody else uses. Um, sometimes I like feeling like you're talking to a lawyer when you're not a lawyer. Um, uh, synchronous learning means in at the same time learning. So if students in class, that would be synchronous learning. If they're working with the teacher and learning those things at the same time. If they're virtual, synchronous would be if the teachers with them virtually at the same time. Asynchronous learning happens virtually and it happens in the classroom. So when we have you know, rotations at the elementary level, um, a small group of students may be working with, maybe working with the teacher uh, directly, and then others are in different groups and they're working asynchronously. They're doing other pieces not attached to the teacher right then and right there at that time. So that's really the difference. Um, so in the schedules, and I'll dive into some of these questions more that dive further dive into you know, the virtual learning aspect. Um, that's really the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. It's just at the same time as synchronous, um, learning, not the, like homework would be an asynchronous type learning piece. Um, those kind of things. Will new material be taught on virtual days or only in school? New material is going to be taught all the time. Um, we have teachers that have been creating videos with new material that have resources ready to go in their Google classrooms and, and things like that. So new material will be taught all the time. And what just won't be if students are in attendance. Um, and there will be a question for a follow up later on uh, for Jennifer here uh, talking about, you know, pick up from middle school or high school. What I can tell you is we will have maps laid out of each of the buildings where the busing will occur. Um, where pick up and drop off will occur and all those procedures and I'll dive into that a little bit more later. Um, my one question from Kate is when the kids are not in school and are learning from home, how are kids that have to go to daycare supposed to log on and participate? This is the biggest challenge we're going to find, um, not just with the daycare piece, but with parents who are essential workers that can't be there at the same time. Synchronous learning may be occurring um, and logging on with their students. So that's why you know it, it's really going to be about the communication piece. Uh, that learning coach we mentioned, the learning coach at home is not supposed to be a teacher at home. The learning coach is supposed to be the connection um, that whether it's the teacher or the, the principal or whoever at the school has a primary person to contact um, when there's, you know, maybe a student's missed a couple days or isn't getting some work done or has questions or whatever. That's what the learning coach is to, to basically assist. They're not going to, they shouldn't be doing the teaching aspect, but they should be um, that primary contact individual. So with the daycare piece, you know, we are conferring with as many people out there as possible. We do know that even on a virtual day that synchronous may be a problem as well. So the true essence of it will be if I'm virtual or if I'm in person, here's the things I need to learn for that week. Let's tackle those pieces and including on the weekend or at night or whatever, do those things. So if you can't meet synchronously, that's OK. You will still have access to all that information and all those pieces and our teachers are going to put their resources there for each of their each of their students in each of their classes so that it's there so if you can't meet synchronously it's the same thing if you know we were normal everybody's coming back to school and a child's sick how do they catch up if they miss that synchronous in-person learning well it's, a, it's the same kind of piece um, will be available i know there are some daycares out there that we've talked to that are planning on having uh, logons there's there's uh, people planning, you know, day camps that they will also help uh, with the logon issues. So um, hopefully that helps some, but in the end, it's going to be really individual conversations to find what works best um, for each student and each uh, connecting with each teacher. 
This goes along with that. The hybrid schedule um, has a lot of virtual requirements on non-school days. My husband and I are both essential workers and our childcare we're not providing assistance with homework, with schoolwork or online lessons. Are, are all children being graded on the online part? Um, I wonder how this impacts children who would not be able to do any remote learning. So it comes back down to, you don't get graded for participation in the online learning, you get graded for what you know and how you can use that information. Um, so if you weren't able to be in online learning, but you were able to view it later or read it later, and then if you have a quiz or a test or a project to do, can you use that learning to help that project? That should be the part graded. Being able to participate in a synchronous online learning, um, that should not be part of the grade. Simple participation is definitely in a virtual environment. Shouldn't be what we are looking to do. Um, is it possible to have continuously alternating days where on the days the kids are in school, the lesson is being streamed live and recorded for the kids at home? Um, the problem with live streaming videos means uh, we have to have the cameras to do so. That would be an investment. But the, the bigger issue is um, it's an individual teacher by teacher basis, whether they want to do that or not. Um, we cannot force them to do so. Um, it's, a, it's a decision each teacher has to make. So that's the, you know, the best thing to do is for each parent to confer with their teacher once they're assigned um, and they know their child's schedule. If hand sanitizer is not allowed on the bus, does that mean the kids will not be able to have it in their bags? They can have it in the bags, uh, but they need to keep it away. Um, having it out creates the hazard. Uh, we can't put bottles of hand sanitizer in as they're coming on or off the bus because of that uh, DOT requirement. But you know, understanding that kids are going to need to bring it to school, that won't be a problem. Uh, let's see, if we choose hybrid and then pull our children out a few weeks in, into it, do all virtual, to do all virtual, will students then be moved to the all virtual teacher? Um, yes, so we have a number of students, as I look at our survey, uh, Mrs. Mikowski and Mr. Sikorsky put some great details together, you know, across, say, kindergarten, based on our results currently, we have about 36 students who uh, parents are, want to choose the virtual option. Not confirmed yet, but they're looking to do so. Well, at the fifth grade level, we have 52, and that's across all buildings. And it varies from building to building. Um, so what we're hoping to do is have teachers that work specifically with the virtual um, students, especially those teachers that uh, may not be able to come back um, for whatever, for their own health reasons and things like that. Um, looking to have, you know, specific people as specific teachers assigned to just the virtual students. So if you start on the hybrid, that student, if you decide to move from hybrid to virtual, um, that student would be moved into a, a virtual classroom fully. Um, Rocco, this is from you and uh, and I really appreciate this question and you definitely have done your research. Um, dear Dr. Hughes, I've reviewed the plan schedule for elementary school students for virtual and hybrid school models. My son is entering second grade. While the CDC and DOH issue guidelines for COVID-19 safety practice, the American Academy of Pediatrics and other medical associations have warned about the dangers of too much screen time. I agree. Per the American Academy of Pediatrics and the World Health Organization, elementary age school children ages 6 to 10 should limit screen time from 1 to 1 and a half hours per day. In the virtual model, the total daily learning hours are 5.7 hours per day. Can you clarify how many hours of the 5.7 will be dedicated to screen time? Well, in the virtual model, um, if they're synchronous and they have work to do on those pieces online, it's going to be screen time. The problem being we're, we're dealing with an unprecedented um, situation that if we could be all in person or the 80% of people that, that chose to have their, their students in person, we would do so. Um, most districts are doing a hybrid model or a couple are actually going fully virtual. Um, and it's which, which is the lesser of, I guess the saying goes, of two evils. Is screen time or not having the learning? Um, I have concerns about screen time. At the same time, we live in a world where most jobs nowadays, you're, you're looking at a screen a lot. Um, so 
student development wise, the brain and such, we are seeing, you know, studies that show that it has an effect, um, usually a negative effect, but we have to choose between do we continue learning or do we just pause everything because of the screen time issue? So in the end, there isn't an easy answer to this. It's let's do the best we can. And um, that's why it's important our students not only get behind the screen, but they grab that instrument. They participate in phys ed. They get outside. They do those do those other things that uh, all of us know are so important. Um, let's dive into some other pieces. So last time I mentioned pre-K. Um, so uh, Kylie asked, is universal pre-K still being offered to all those who were chosen in the lottery? Uh, and will there be a virtual online option for them? The virtual online option we haven't looked at because pre-K really is about, a lot about um, play and is really about um, hands-on play and interaction. Um, we don't want students, especially at a pre-K level, to sit behind a computer screen, um, or even the younger ones to do so, especially at the pre-K level. And we did receive notice that um, the pre-K funding was coming through. But the caveat to that was, it was released on Friday, um, but the caveat that we've been told is, well, even though the funding says it's the same as you had last year, your allotment, um, we're looking at, we've been told to expect at least a 20% reduction. I wish we would know exactly what numbers they're talking about. And this is, this is why we have to constantly change and it's hard to keep up because we're constantly getting different information. Uh, the division of budget um, that is, you know, basically uh, under the guise of uh, the governor's office. Um, did release that, but we don't know exactly how much funding will be there. So we're expecting at least a 20% cut. It could be 30, could be could be 50. Uh, none of our, none of the districts know. But what that does is it limits the number of seats that we have. Um, we also fund out of that grant um, about 100,000 goes to Educates, about 100,000 goes to Head Start, and then we fund our own classes at uh, Blaisdell and Cloverbank with those. So we're still going to be offering it. It will be in a similar hybrid model for the class, the seats that we do have. Uh, hopefully we can have all the seats that we did. And in future years, we're gonna be looking to see if we can have more seats um, versus you know other funding opportunities. So uh, I wish I had a more solid answer. We'll have some seats. I don't know if we'll have all 76, I think that we have, 76. I'm just looking over to Mrs. Dugan who knows the answers on this stuff. So she just gave me one of these. So we'll, We'll, we'll make sure that uh, information is out there as soon as we get the application done. And interesting enough, even though we got it on Friday, this is how crazy some things are at times. The due date was August 7th. So they just got it to us on Friday, but it was due a week ago. If you figure that out, please, please let us know. Um, question says, what if I changed my mind from when I originally filled out the survey? So the survey gave us information that is unbelievably valuable. It gives us a pretty good idea of numbers, including transportation numbers to start with. This week, a survey will be coming out that has basically two questions on it. Do you want virtual learning? Yes, no. Will you, do you need transportation, uh, bus transportation to and from school? Yes, no. That is going to be the commitment. So once this week is over and we have those commitments done, then we're going to dive in fully. Our principals are ready to go. Uh, they have all these tentative plans they've been working on. Absolutely amazing, um, especially at the elementary level. Um, it, it's 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 crazy because you're trying to put kids in certain classes, but at the same time, what if this one becomes virtual? It, it's I give credit to the the four ladies who are just trying to figure all this out with sand under their feet. Um, so yeah, commitment will be this week, so you can stay in your mind. These forms were meant to also give you input. Um, I plan on continuing forms in the future, not just for reopening pieces, but for any questions that come up. So maybe we, we have these on a monthly basis um, because the questions we've got are so great and uh, the feedback has been has been good. And I understand the frustration as well too. Um, but I figure these are ways for us to, to really get things going and um, give everybody a lot of information. 
so virtual again, if students opt for virtual learning at the elementary level and then opt to go back into person in January, second semester, where will they be placed? Will they be placed in their own building? Where, where there is room? Where are the plans to make the smooth transition? If other students come back more because of the percent who choose virtual, how will all this work? So Tammy, a lot of good questions. Um, so if students choose to come back in January after being virtual, they will be placed in classrooms in the building they're supposed to be attending. That's where we'll look at these numbers. Um, I truly hope that the virus and the issue is under control um, by the winter, but at the same time, I, I share the concerns of uh, medical professionals out there that with flu season coming, um, it could get worse and exacerbate uh, the symptoms that uh, present during COVID. Um, so those those things will be worked on as as they come forth. Um, for plans for a smooth transition, our administrators and our teachers are awesome. So I have no doubt they'll make it the smoothest they possibly can. And uh, we'll do everything we can to support them in their effort to do so. So yeah, they will be in the building they're, they're supposed to be in. Um, I've had some parents ask, well, if it's if, if there's room in one building but not another, can I just go to the other building? That's all these residency things going on, and uh, that's that's really tough to to even think about this now because that's also a policy issue that we would have to look to change. So Amy asked a question about homeschooling. Um, you know, saying virtual learning didn't work, can totally understand. Um, therefore, we'll be homeschooling him for the time being until things settle down. Um, under normal circumstances, homeschool children could return to regular, regular schooling at any time. Under this current situation, is this still the case? Absolutely. So if you're homeschooling, that means you're doing it all on your own. Um, the school's not providing curriculum or assistance or those kind of pieces. Um, you're really doing it on your own. If at any point you decide, you know what, homeschooling's not working or you know, whatever situations come up at home that, that make it diff impossible to do so, can easily switch to either virtual learning or in-person learning. Homeschooling is a, is a different topic, so um, I thank you for the question. That's, that's a good one that some other people have asked as well, too. Let me pause for a drink. All right. Um, will Chromebooks be provided to all students? So interesting enough, we had about 50% of our students, our parents say they don't, they're all set. They're good to go. We have about a thousand, if the thousand Chromebooks we've ordered for the high school specifically, if they were to come in, we could be one-to-one -one K-12. Um, two years ago, about two and a half years ago when I got here, we had no capacity to, you know, have devices in every classroom and things like that. So we've, we've made this happen very quickly. And then in the pandemic, it just exacerbated it. We handed out about 700 Chromebooks, some iPads as well, depending on the age and the device needs for the student um, during three different times um, in the spring. Um, if you have a device need, uh, Mrs. Danza and Mr. Sullivan, our technology, technology data privacy officer, are working with our principals in the curriculum office to uh, make sure that any student that needs one We'll get one. So you will be able to be provided those. We're looking to set up days um, to hand those out. It might be um, before Labor Day, some of those hand out days. Um, it might be um, the, before the first day of school. Uh, we're going to figure out those particulars, but what we need you to do is make sure you contact your building principal and request to be put on a list where you have a Chrome, excuse me, a Google Sheet being put together that has all that information, especially any notes. So, you know, if you have one child at home and maybe mom or dad needs the, the computer to do the work, well, you have a device available, but you really don't have a device available for them to use. So that would be a situation where we want to make sure we get your device. If you have multiple kids at home, and I know even just listening to my four, um, they could, if one of them has something, the other one doesn't have it, immediately they want the other thing the other one has. It's magic how that works. Um, well, those are the situations where we can make sure you have more than enough. What we also want to do is we're looking at the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade level. 
to make sure every kid has, every student has a device. And then hopefully planning to have them take those devices home and bring them back. Take them home and bring them back. So that way there wouldn't necessarily have to be any classroom uh, sets at all to, to have. They would have their own individual device as long as each parent signs off on the forms that we require to, to do so. Um, so yeah, Chromebooks, Chromebooks are available. And uh, even with, we have enough right now to have everybody have one, um, except for about half the high school. But um, with all the people that already have a device, the 50%, we have we should have more than enough to make make sure that every student has access to a device if they need one. So hopefully a few parents are big sigh of relief on that one. Um, that, that's a that's a very popular question. Um, here's a question from Debbie and Debbie, I appreciate this, especially being a retired teacher. Um, and. Um, the reopening school is having Wednesday a virtual day. Um, so why could Wednesday also be used as an attendance day? Well, the reason for the Wednesday not being an attendance day, since every day is a deep cleaning day, is because our teachers need time to work together to plan. Um, In-person learning is tough as it is, but to plan virtual and to plan a personalized virtual for every single student is labor intensive. It's worthwhile to make it personalized, but it takes a lot of time to do so. So those Wednesdays are meant for them to catch their breath and to get all the work they need done. And also so we can provide interventions. We can provide other services on those days versus interrupting the learning on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday. Um, I think pretty much every school district in one has, has gone with a virtual on a Wednesday. They may be doing AA or AB on the other days, but um, that Wednesday piece has become very critical uh, for those reasons. And then also, will students have the same teacher or virtual as well as their class in classroom teacher? Yes, that's what the plan is. Is so if um, you know if, if I'm Mr. Hughes and I'm teaching in third grade and uh, I have 24 kids that I, that are supposed to be in my class. 12 attend one day, 12 attend the other day. I'm I'm the teacher for for all 24, whether they're in person or virtual. So great question, and that was a question uh, many also asked. So thank you. Let's see. So this goes to a cohort type question. Um, with our last name starting with a Y. It appears we're on a schedule of Tuesday and Friday. Can we change that if our childcare or other day fits better and, uh, since we would be scrambling for help? Um, I will give that a big tentative yes, because what we want to do is set a basis of once we know who is committed to virtual. So that's why the alphabet may change just a little bit. But at the same time, we want to work with each parent individually if they have a concern like you do and so many others. You're not the only one. Uh, whether it's uh, households with multiple last names or, um, you know, maybe it's a daycare or child care issue. Those are the kind of things that uh, we want to do whatever we can to, to, to help. Um, and we're going to do make that happen. So a bunch of the questions we've gotten are like A through L, but then it's L through Z. Um, those are tentative right now. Um, and it will all come down to how many virtual. If we have, you know, we're saying 20%, so that leaves us almost a thousand kids. If the percentage holds out that are planning virtual um, across the 4,600 that we have, if if that holds true, then you know, if there's more that say virtual that just happen to be at the front of the alphabet, versus, but our principals have done a great job. They've they've laid out plans for all this based on everybody. And then as those things change, they're making changes as well. Um, so if you see any of our principals, um, do this, do this for me. Thank them. Um, if they look frazzled, um, they look tired, um, it's because they are. They, they're, they're busting their tails to make something happen that you know, none of us were trained to make happen. Um, and the same thing goes for you know, other administrative staff. Um, I know talking to Mr. Gray, 
we keep in contact all the time what's going to go on with sports and all these other pieces going on or what's going on with extracurriculars and our food service you know mr whipple and the crew have done unbelievable job since this happened we served over 60,000 meals this summer it was averaging over 2,000 a day during the pandemic um regular school year so him and his and the, the staff his staff um they're they're tired but they're they're coming in every single day and knocking it out so thank you thank you i know our teachers are working unbelievably hard um, to get ready for the school year and they have concerns and um and we're trying to answer all those concerns and, and do the best of it um, but at the end we're we're dealing with a lot of unknowns and if we knew the answer to the unknowns you know maybe uh frontier should be leading the way but we're going to try it as it is so please please thank them and thank our civil service crew um we have 12 month employees that have been here every single day mowing the lawns getting our buildings ready they're going through right now and redoing classrooms moving furniture moving out moving out um you know bookcases and other things um they're in the offices they're they're answering your phone calls they're feeling your frustration when you call or email um just as the rest of us are but they're the ones that first get that phone call so please please thank them um, and then when school starts up our bus drivers um i don't have the power to give them sainthood but i clearly would if i could because they're getting ready to roll and i mean roll uh, with the start of the school year um, and being the first first line of interactions with our falcons so please please get if you get a chance you know thank them for what they're doing um you know i, I think it's pretty important uh okay let's move on to the next one as i digress a little bit um so for daycare essential workers and those kind of pieces you know um, one person asks is there any financial help for these for the expensive programs um and is it a counterproductive that if students are going to daycare on the opposite days of being in school um, now they're exposed to other children on random children on, that may be wearing masks may not be wearing masks and coming back to exposure to our kids um, this is the big challenge we're going to face and that's why the screening that we have the temperature taking that we're asking parents to make sure they do and those kind of pieces are so critical um, we don't have the financial means to provide child care um, the child care when we did provide it before an after-school program was separate from the school budget it cannot be supported by the school by the school budget um, because it's not considered an essential even though it is we all know it is it's not considered an essential part of the academic program so we're going to work to um, hopefully answer a lot more of these questions the, the biggest unknown is is especially the, the daycare child care situation um, so many of our parents work um and our essential workers and honestly you know everybody that works is helping to keep our economy in the western new york region alive and going um so you know, anything we can do certainly can but we can't provide financial help um, i do have a couple right at school questions coming up a little bit later um, we've been looking for additional space and and other facilities that people have mentioned as possible so far for any programs we've been told no um, so, you know, our, we're kind of limited at this point of some of the things we can do, but uh, the daycare and essential worker piece, if I can't really give you answers, but if you want to call or stop me when I'm out and about or whatever and just chat or just vent, you can certainly do so. I'm here to listen. What will the hours of operation for elementary students be? Start time dismissal. So. We are looking at altering those. Um, we are looking at a little bit of a shorter day. So that way our teachers, not just elementary, but middle school and high school, would also have additional time at the end of their day, um, any end or before, to make those contacts with students that are not in session on those days. So, but as soon as we have the final commitment letters and or have an idea what's going on, we're hoping to release those hours this week. Our transportation department is diving into it. We basically asked uh, transportation to schedule buses for 20 kids at a time. And what does that look like? That will have a big, big impact into what our times look like. Um, 
But one thing that, you know, has popped up is, you know, do we switch them? And I don't know what the answer is right now, but do we, you know, research says adolescents do better if they go to school later. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of elementary teachers say, can we go to school earlier? So um, I've heard it from a lot of different angles. And maybe some of you can chime in in, in uh, the, the forum email on your thoughts. But with 75% of parents saying uh, they would be okay with, you know, altering um, the schedule to do so, um, it's something we're looking heavily at. And hopefully, you'll have a decision this week. And this just is a follow up from Sarah. Um, you mentioned the school day would consist of six and a half to seven hours. Um, does that also mean the virtual learning days would require the same time commitment? Um, with the virtual learning piece, there's a lot of things that can get done in, in, in real time. It basically comes down to how long does it take you to do the work that the teachers are asking you to do or the learning that you, that you need to do. You, know, you can always spend more time and dive into, dive into even more of the learning, go deeper with it. Um, and some students will just do what they have to do or maybe not do what they have to do versus diving in for the extra pieces. So we're actually looking at a little bit of a shorter day. Um, so as I said previously, so our teachers and, and such can dive in and that will also might also allow us to not have a before and an after school program for elementary students. It might just allow it just to be all after. So, you know, those kind of considerations, you know, ideas that people are throwing out there. Um, again, you may not think I'm reading all these. It takes me a few hours to go through all of them um, each time, but we definitely are. And the other same question from Sarah it had to deal with kids with allergies. Um, mentioned they wouldn't be eating in the classroom. Um, we will have the same protocols for food allergies that we've had before. Um, so the you know the the allergy table, as you put it, um, would still be in effect. Um, we we don't want to uncast any child, and just because of an allergy, one of my closest friends, uh, one of my close friends in, in the education world, um, his daughter. Um, has a allergy to sesame seed and um, has gone through lots of treatments for it to lessen the allergy. But, uh, you know, it's one of those allergies where if she, she gets a little bit of sesame seed, it, it could kill her. It's an anaphylactic shock. So, no, no child should be ostracized because they have an allergy at all. That should never happen to a child anyway. So, yes, we'll still have those allergy tables per se and um, those kind of pieces. So, thank you for your question. Got a question, a couple questions on masks. So let me dive into that a little bit. Um, will everyone be required to wear mask correctly? From Michelle. Yes, Michelle, they got to wear the mask correctly over the nose and the mouth. Um, let's see if I can get my in here. So, for if any kids are watching at home, I do have some Falcon ones, but I'm wearing my Bills one today. So, this is what we want to look like. Okay. Not this. Not this. Not this. And I'm sure there's a whole lot of other ways you can come come up with to wear it differently. You know, not on top of your head. This doesn't help. Yeah, fix that hair. Looks like this. Okay. So yes, they got to wear them correctly. And some, you know, behind the ears. Um, somebody did ask a question. You know, especially for sensitivity purposes. Um, I've seen some some of the ones with hats and they have the buttons on the side and then this hooks to the buttons versus behind the ears um, that's a pretty cool idea i'm going to leave it up to the principals to make that decision on hats because the other thing it does it can also you know keep germ pieces in the ones that go around the neck we've seen you know the research has been showing that it may not be um it may actually make the matters worse um so you know just just be informed and make a decision that's you know it's comfortable for your child to do so this one's pretty thick compared to some of them out there. So let's see. From the first form, I heard you say the elementary school, and this is from Michelle, uh, would be at least 12 to 14 students on in-class days of the hybrid option. If they're desk or distance six feet apart, why would my child need to wear the mask the entire day with just five minute breaks here and there? So the wording that we got from Erie County Department of Health is it's all about risk, okay? so. If you, if you see some of the pieces out there about wearing masks, if nobody's wearing a mask, the chances of being infected go up greatly. If you come in contact with somebody that, that's infected. If one person is wearing a mask, it decreases. If both people are wearing a mask, 
it decreases greatly. If both people wear a mask and they're socially distant, it's almost, it's, it's less than one percentage wise. So that's what we want to be able to do um, in the classroom is to lessen the risk as much as possible. Um, so I understand not, you know, if we're distant, not wearing the mask, those kind of pieces, but we're also dealing with students and especially our younger students, um, their immune systems, they, they get sick a lot more than anybody else, but you know, they're constantly, you know, they have germs and that's where, you know, I understand our teachers and other professionals and, and, uh, our, our people that are in the buildings, kids are going to be kids, but if we have expectations for them to wear the mask correctly and such, they'll do it. They'll surprise you. They'll do it. Um, so yes, we still need to wear them. And that's where somebody asked me about construction workers. We have a lot of construction going on right now. So what's the difference between construction workers and students? Well, if you're able to walk around the buildings, but you, you can't right now, but you might see some of the pictures we've been posting about, uh, uh, about um, you know updates happening in our buildings, you know, middle school science classrooms. And if, you know, outside, they're staying pretty distance, but they're also outside. If they can't stay distance, they have to wear a mask. And when they don't, when they're not being socially distant, we make sure we keep t telling them if we have to, um, if they're not, to wear a mask. But if you see some of the pictures that we have of um, some of the construction workers, say, in the classroom, doing ceiling and uh, the tiles and such, or they're up in the ceiling and they're doing piping, uh, plumbing and such to different classrooms or different areas. Um, if they're up, their head's up in the ceiling, they're socially distant. There's nobody else around them. Um, they've been putting casework into our, our science classrooms in the middle school. That casework, you know, like the cabinets and stuff, you know, the classic science cab cabinets. And um, a lot of times you're only going to see one person working in the, in the room at a time. So as long as, you know, social distance is there, especially among adults, for kids, it's a little more difficult because they can be socially distant. But what, what does that mean from having little Richie jump up from his desk without a mask on and run somewhere else? Um, those are the kind of things we're hoping to avoid by making sure students are wearing their masks um, while in class with, with breaks in there. But if we get a chance to get them outside, the teacher gets them outside, can they take them off? Yep, as long as they're staying spread out, those kind of pieces. It's going to be a learning process for all of us, um, for everybody included. So hopefully that answers the question on that one. Um, Melanie asked a question about temperatures. What is the temperature threshold for elementary kids? And what is the range that parents should look out for? So it's interesting. Some of the, even this this weekend, some of the numbers of some of the ideas have changed. Um, the temperature may not be the most uh, reliable. Dr. Fossey said uh, just in the last couple of days. Um, it's definitely an indicator. Um, you know, 100.4. Honestly, you know, some some kids or some adults as well. My temperature tends to run like a 97, is what my body tends to run at. Somebody would say that makes me cold-hearted. Um, that's not true though. Um, so. If your student's running a temperature, it's always best to, to err on the side of safety. Um, you know, I, I, I would hate to have, you know, oh, maybe back in, you know, when I was a kid, um, if you had a low grade fever, it was still go to school, especially when I stayed at my grandparents' place. It was get to school. Um, well, that get to school attitude now is very different because we were just dealing with flu and cold and stuff then, but now we're dealing with a virus that that has killed 160,000 plus Americans. Um, so it's 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 definitely something to be more aware of and to be more cautious about. So if, if you're you know if you get oh, low grade fever, some kids may run normally a little hot. You know the 98.6 is typically normal. Um, some people run a little less. A little higher, just that's their metabolism themselves. But if you don't get to that 100 range, you see that third digit pop in, uh, that third whole number. Shout out to the math teachers. The third whole number get in there, then um, we, we, we don't want that to occur. So please, please keep them. Um, Tom asked, what is the district's plan if there's a COVID outbreak, if we have an outbreak? So let's define what an outbreak is. Having a positive case here and there is not an outbreak. If there is an outbreak, 
um, where the infection rates are going up, things like that. Maybe it's at one building, maybe it's across a district, or maybe we're fine as a district and our school buildings are, but across Western New York, the cases spike and we end up percentages go up. Well, the governor's already said that if the infection rate gets to 9%, schools are shut down in that region. We're under 1% right now and the numbers keep going lower. So I'm really cautiously optimistic that we can get back and uh, we do these precautions, we can do it in a, in, a, in a very safe way. If we do have an outbreak where the, per, the percentage is, goes up, we end up closing schools. Um, you know, that 9% closes us down as a region. Um, but if we have that individually here or anywhere else, you know, it would be a case by case basis. And that's where we work with the Erie County Department of Health. And um, as Dr. Gail Burstein said, they don't have the power to close schools. Only school superintendents can. Um, I can tell you, I won't be putting out a video if we're closing schools for a pandemic. You know, snow day is one thing. Um, pandemic closing, something different. Um, so if we have an outbreak with any, if, if there's a few cases here and there, and we expect to have a few positives here and there, because it's going to happen, then um, that's not an outbreak. An outbreak is large percentage of numbers. You know, anything that gets over 5%, um, you know, us individual will be looking to, to, to close. And I would, I'd be willing to say schools across our region um, in March, on the 15th of March, when all the superintendents or Erie 1 BOCES got together, um, and Erie 2 BOCES, um, on that Sunday, as the numbers kept going up across the state, we made the decision to close. Um, and that was two days before the governor decided to, to close schools. So um, I, I know I have wonderful colleagues in each of the neighboring districts, and um, we try to put our collective brain power and experience together um, and what we hear to make those kind of decisions, uh, especially if there is an outbreak. So what happens if someone tests positive for COVID and a child is on the contact list? Well, we have some protocols up now um, on our, our reopening our uh, reopening page um, that talks about, you know, COVID testing and the contact tracing. If a child does come down positive, um, what happens is um, Department of Health lets that building's principal know who will let me know. And we'll go through who could be possible contacts based on their definition and give them those contacts. We'll also let parents know. We can't say who and what, but we'll let parents know in general we have a positive in this building. Now, what I what I hope doesn't happen is that if we get a positive, everybody stops sending their child to school. Because with the testing we now have in place um, statewide and the, the latest tests that the saliva tests they've approved, FDA has approved that the NBA and, and Yale have basically traded and have been testing out, um, there's a quicker turnaround um, as these things are happening. So um, parents will be contacted. It might be a general note coming from, from my desk saying, you know, we've had a positive test in such and such building. Um, you know, anybody that's been uh, part of that contact list has been traced and uh, will follow through and do so. Um, when should we expect to see, again, this is from Shannon, when should we expect to see teacher assignments via mail? Um, once we get the commitments going um, next week, then the assignments will follow right thereafter. Um, um, mail, email, every different way we can do it. Um, our principals are great communicating and, and uh, they're rock stars when they come to it. So um, is there a waiting list for special considerations? Um, there isn't a waiting list yet, but what we're going to do is it's all going to depend on how many choose virtual at any particular grade level and how many choose um, the hybrid model. Um, that will, you know, students who are self-contained classes will definitely be on the first on the list, ENL and at-risk students will be first next on the list. And then we'll be looking at, um, you know, our essential workers um, along with, um, and if we can do it for the, for the primary grade levels um, before we do it for, you know, middle school, high school, that's definitely what we're gonna look to do. And then another question, federal holidays, would it be possible to consider only adjusting the cohort that misses that data Wednesday? And a couple of you have also sent this question. And you know what? I, that's that's yes. I love I love that idea. And so if we have you know 
instead of um, having, if we have Columbus Day, um, which I think is our real first holiday or a staff day that we have scheduled for September 28th, um, instead of having cohort A or cohort one um, miss that and move everybody, why don't we just have cohort A move to that Wednesday? Um, I think that's that's on the money. I love that idea. Thank you for you know asking that question. Um, some other people did as well too. That's that's on the money, and that's why we're doing these forums and stuff to get your feedback. Um, but we'll make sure we put a calendar out that purposely says which day is a which. So instead of disrupting the whole week, I think that makes tons of sense. So thank you, Shannon. Let's see. Um, so drop off and pick up. Um, I can understand a lot of parents would rather drop them off and pick them up. So since your children have never been at school before, how do we know just drop how to drop them off without getting out of the car? Will there be somebody to escort them inside to make sure they get where they need? So I'm guessing, um, based on this, your child's going to be coming to kindergarten this year. So they've probably never been to the school. And yes, there will be people to, to escort them in and out of the buildings. Um, no doubt. We don't expect you to just pull up to the curb and kick your child out and have them tuck and roll. That's 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 not what we're looking at here. We want you to pull up, you know, look at the door, and we'll have, you know, our staff and our adults help them get to where they need to get to. I really wish we could let parents take their children, especially on their first day of school, to the classroom. Um, it's something I, you know, I was lucky to do with with mine. Um, and it's, you know, and as a, as a superintendent educator, it's there's always tears on the first day. Even the kid that you don't think is going to have tears. Um, and usually it's not the kids that have tears, it's the parents. So, um, and also with pickup, will it be somebody escorting the kids out to make sure they get to the right vehicle? Yes. Um, those are all the particulars that each building is going to be doing. We will also have maps of where pickup is and, and dismissal is and buses versus, you know, this and that and, and those kind of things. So, uh, so great question. Thank you, Carly. Um, let's see, regarding the bus, can parents drop and pick up when able without committing to every school day? You can. We just want people to make sure that any commitment they do make, it's commitment for every day. If you can't commit to every day before and after, um, don't say you're committing to it. So that way we have the spot on the bus. But what's really important, if, if, you, if you're planning on picking them and dropping off every single day, or as one parent asked, if they walk, do I have to have them saved in the bus? No, you can make them walk. Um, I know I can't wait to see that day when uh, mine can walk to the middle school. Um, we got a couple things going on the board over here. Um, so that's definitely, you don't, you don't have to commit to every school day. Um, if you commit, make sure it's for every school day if there's some days you can't drop up and pick up don't do that commitment for transportation please don't do that for tra transportation um let's another one um how do i let transportation know if i'm moving so my home can be considered for a route these happen all the time uh, when people move in and out of the district um we we put it into our system um so you know when you register and then if your situation changes, you let your building know and the building and you can also contact transportation to make sure. And, you know, that gets changed in our system. So then your spot gets added to the route. It's, it's the same whether it's pandemic related or non-pandemic related. So it's the same same procedure as we'd have any other time. So I'm about an hour in. I think you can get through some more here. Um, as seen in other, so let's talk testing in the high school schedule. As seen in other states, kids and teachers, and this is from Tina, are testing positive within the first week of reopening, resulting in closing down the school. True, the issue we're seeing in other states is their infection rate has been up. They're nowhere near how low New York is. Their infection rates are well over 10, 20 percent um, in most of the states, and a lot of them do not have a mask mandate. So I think that's something else to consider because we see other states we want to take, we want to use some of what they're doing as examples of what to do and what not to do. 
and based on many other states, you know, their infection rates are definitely not what we want to do. Um, but my child's in high school and following the hybrid model. He still would be in a lot of classes with different kids and teachers, even at less capacity. You know, eight different classes, switching rooms. If one person tests positive, how will you know uh, who to quarantine? Uh, would you need to now quarantine all those eight to nine classes that my child was in? So this goes back to the contact tracing piece that even if a student tests positive and the switching is occurring and things like that, it's they contact trace for anybody who's been less than the six feet social distance for more than 10 minutes. Um, so that that's a critical component to all this. Um, so the fact that the students will be changing classes, um, you know, multiple times in a day, that really doesn't increase the contact tracing component as long as kids aren't dropping their masks and hanging out and um, and for any couples keep the mask on please um, those kind of pieces so you know that 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 uh, the testing tracing component really becomes um, not as big an issue as, as we think it would be that's why that social distancing and masks is super critical and I just froze on the screen. Am I still streaming live? Oh, there we go. Sorry, the screen's behind you, behind the camera. I'm trying not to watch myself talk, but when I froze, I was worried that we weren't live anymore. I have, I have a lot of help here, trying to make me look good. Um, so Jennifer asked a question. Um, it was stated at middle school, teachers move, not students. What about students in a self-contained 15-1 class they have math and ELA in a separate class that integrate for social studies and science. So students will be moving. We'll, we want them to move as least as possible. Um, at the high school, that's not as easy because they're all credit based courses and students choose various different courses to go to. Um, at, you know, a ninth grader could have very different courses than another ninth grader, um, even though they're taking some of the same base courses, English, math, science, and social studies. But they could have different versions of those at different levels. Um, for the self-contained students, there's probably there's probably going to be some movement, um, but we want to lessen that movement as much as possible. So you know whether integrated in social studies and science and those kind of pieces, um, yes, there 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 will be some movement for those 151 students, just as there will be for any student. Um, but we're going to try to minimize it as much as possible for all students. And Mr. Sikorsky has got it. He's working on. He's knocking it out for his 1,200 students over there. So uh, tons of credit goes out to him. Let's see. We might get through the rest of these. Let's see. Um, student related. Will a student ask this question? So uh, Santa, who's class of uh, 2021, thank you for asking them questions. And I'm sure your classmates are really wondering what's going to happen this year. Um, Will we be able to use district approved backpacks, especially in the high school, to limit use of lockers? Yes. So backpacks, even though we've for years been saying no backpacks, you might be carrying a weapon, you might be on which which do we go with? Do we we, we we've never had we've had very, very few instances over the last few years where somebody even had a knife in school, and usually it wasn't I can't remember one that was a threat issue, that it was somebody had a knife in their bag because they're out hunting or whatever the case would be and it, it still gets rules but there wasn't an intent involved um so do we how do we balance the 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 safety piece with the backpacks well the the greater threat right now is covid so yeah you can have your backpacks um that doesn't mean bring everything in the kitchen sink in your backpack to school okay um, so yeah, we're, we're going to try to not use lockers at all because of that. Um, you said, I know you touched on music, but what about theater productions like plays and musicals? We're going to have to figure that out. Um, we have an awesome department, uh, along with Mrs. Voto and all the crew and, you know, it's everybody over there that we're going to have to figure it out. Um, with the social distancing pieces, some, you know, luckily our musical isn't too later into the second half of the year but the play is the first half of the year. So maybe we have to push them things, maybe make smaller pieces, maybe instead of an audience, there's, you know, we stream it like we're doing right now. Um, so 
I also hope you can make arrangements for these activities, especially being your senior year. Um, what is going to happen with the high school dances like homecoming, junior ball, and prom? Um, I wish I could say I know, but it all depends what's going on with the pandemic and COVID at that point. Um, the best person to talk to is your senior class reps and working with Mr. Charlotte. Um, those, are the, those are the best avenues. Um, hopefully, you know, say, you know, hopefully it's not impacted like it was this past year in different ways, but most likely it's not going to be the same. Um, and I can't look into a crystal ball or magic eight ball right now and, and tell you what that looks like. Um, I wish I could. So you wouldn't have to worry about it anymore and you could just plan on having a having a normal awesome senior year but uh it'll be a little bit different um was a plan for classrooms that get really hot this is from megan i heard fans were helping i heard fans are not allowed fans are allowed as long as we also have fresh air coming in uh, as long as windows and such are open so that that can definitely help um we don't want kids if kids are sharing desks and lockers Nope, but not, we don't want that. Um, they may have to if they change classes, but that's where hand sanitizer and those kind of things will be there to help. Um, is the new after school program going to be up and running for the first day of school? Yes, it is. Um, will charges be adjusted for new schedules due to the hybrid plan? And yes, they will. So, you know, I have a presentation on the right at school uh, numbers as it relates to previous years and this year. Um, and they're they're constantly working to create different options for the plans and that will also be based on what our schedules are um, but um, you know we have an educator um, that is is the the regional person leading that program uh, Jennifer Stam and she's fabulous um, so we know we're in good hands hands with that crew who do I talk to if I'm not receiving any emails or letters from the district that means you're Contact information probably hasn't been updated in the student management system if the campus slash school tool. So what you can do is contact the building um, or or the district office here, and they will get you in contact with our with our data person to make sure that information is correct. So that should help. Sometimes you know we don't update those things, and if you don't have an email listed, please add an email. Okay? Will my kids be able to buy lunch? Yes, they will. And if you get free or reduced lunch, that will be available too. And lunch will be available on days when you're virtual. You just got to come pick it up. And in some cases, we can deliver, um, like we did uh, during the pandemic and such. But uh, yes. Um, Jillian asking you about uh, wondering about an orientation uh, for a sixth grader coming up through. Um, most of them will probably be they'll probably be virtual uh, for just not just middle school but for kindergarten and ninth grade um, visitors are not going to be allowed to the buildings because you know that creates a contact tracing problem um, and a whole screening issue that we have we will have temperature readers at, at our entrances um, to help with you know those that have to come into the building but if somebody's looking to visit it's basically going to be employees only employees and, and students so uh, this is just another lunch one um, free reduced yep even on a remote learning or totally virtual learning daily it they would breakfast and lunch will still be available um, question about BOCES from Danielle whose son uh, um, attends BOCES the HVAC um, crew yeah awesome programs over there um, what does the hybrid plan mean for him? So BOCES had an everyday AB, AB, AB with no Wednesdays off. Um, as of last week, they changed that because most, almost every district has Wednesday as a remote learning day. So for us, um, any of our students who attend BOCES, whether it's through CT or other programs, will go on the day the program is, is supposed to be. So most likely it would be the first day, the cohort one. So all of our uh, OCCT students and others will go on cohort one days. So that would be Monday and Thursday. But if Monday's not there, then we'll move that Monday to the Wednesday or, you know, we'll, we'll figure out what the schedule looks like and, and make sure that's laid out specifically for all students at BOCES. But yes, they would still attend. And, and the other question becomes if a student's virtual, 
for all the school, all the classes at Frontier, can they still go to BOCES? They can, but the question becomes, um, if they're able to go to BOCES, why can't they attend the classes at Frontier? So that's that's a question that will be asked um, if that comes that way. Um, Tom has a question. If my child is virtual learning all week, will they still be able to do band and orchestra? My daughter loved being in orchestra the past years and she wants to continue with it. My son is going to fourth grade and has shown an interest in learning and playing an instrument. If they're both doing virtual, are they eligible in some way to participate? Yes, they are. Um, we have an awesome music department and uh, that's been working with other music departments around the area to come up with these plans. Um, you might have virtual lessons, small group virtual pieces um, and things. I have a fourth grader who wants to play the violin and is dying to start. Um, so I know exactly where you're coming from. Um, last question, how is P going to work virtually? I mean, our phys ed teachers, some of the things they put together last year for virtual phys ed, it was absolutely amazing. And I, I want to be honest, I think it was better than any other district put together. So our, I think our department's the best in the area. And uh, I challenge other schools that say there's this, um, I think we got some, some Falcon uh, PE teachers that would be ready to roll if that's the case. Um, so, you know, whether it's getting kids up and moving, you know, our teach, our phys ed department has already been in the virtual environment. Um, they have videos they use in the classroom for brain breaks and things like that they've, that they've created. They're going to be creating new, new things uh, to do so. So it definitely will still happen. And uh, we have an awesome crew that's going to knock that out. Uh, only got a couple more, so I think I can close these out before we get too late. Um, during the call, during the forum the other day, it sounded like AP students may only have the option of hybrid. Is that correct? No, AP students can will be able to do both hybrid and virtual. Um, music and gym plans are very unclear. K-8, will look, we're most likely going to be virtual for most of those. Um, and then at the high school level, you know, the high school is still looking at having the regular nine-day schedule, uh, nine, excuse me, nine-period schedule. Um, so those are the, the kind of pieces that we worked out. Um, and I trust our music teachers and our, and our phys ed crew again to, to have plans that, that will impact in, in, the, in a very positive way. So the specifics will be coming from them because they're the experts on it. Um, also an AP question, you mentioned the last forum, the AP class is going to be graded pass-fail. Can you confirm that? Well, I mentioned the pass-fail because students can choose an option of taking a class pass-fail. Is I really would love for them to challenge themselves. Take a class that maybe maybe you, you think, ah, I can't do that. Yeah, how do you know? How do you know until you give it a shot? You know? So no, they won't be they'll be graded, but there's always an option for a student to take something, especially that's more challenging or something outside their, their comfort zone, uh, as pass fail. So though we want students to just challenge themselves. Um, so when they, you know, when they walk out of Frontier and go out into the greater world, um, they're, re they're ready to rock and roll, and whatever that may look like. Um, libraries. Will classrooms have libraries that are available to children where books can be quarantined following student use? Yes. And this is from Mrs. D. So, yes, Heidi, um, we will be doing that. We'll have to quarantine the books. I think it's for four days um, to do so. Um, yes, books need to be quarantined. Um, most definitely. Uh, when outside is taking place, can the students take their mask off? Yep. Social distance, though. We got to say social distance. So we're playing tag. Got to wear the mask. If uh, we're doing something else and we can be socially distanced, you know, I would, I would definitely I would say yes, especially if they're outdoors. Two more, and then we'll wrap this up um, for, for this forum. And then anybody that wants to show up at 9 o'clock tomorrow uh, or watch it later can do so. If you know yet, do you, excuse me, from Danielle, do you know yet if reason exams will be given in the 2021 school year for the students that graduate with their Regents diploma? Well, interesting enough, uh, Regents weren't given this year, but as long as students pass their coursework in those Regents classes, they were given credit for that Regents course. Um, I can't. If I'm going to look into the crystal ball, I'm going to take a guess here. With lots of schools going virtual or hybrid, I'm predicting, even though we don't know, and you know, hopefully I'm right on this one, 
that the same thing will happen with regions testing this year, that we won't have regions testing um, because of the challenges related to these different models. Um, and that, you know, if students pass the class and do well in the class, that they'll, that they'll um, get credit for that for a regions diploma or advanced regions diploma. Um, so, you know, challenge yourself. Doesn't hurt. Um, may hurt momentarily, but it'll be worth it in the end. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping the same thing holds true for three through eight testing. Um, you know, three through eight testing is really about checking our curriculum and seeing where we're at. Um, it's not a it's not a score for a student, and it shouldn't be treated as such. So you know, last year they canceled them. I'm hoping the same thing happens this year. Um, so if you know if anybody else at the state level sees this or you advocate for it, please tell them the 33 testing for this year and regions testing. You know. Parents and students are under enough pressure as it is, and teachers. And then the last one, I hesitate to read a question about snow days, but I'm going to. Um, what will happen in the event of bad weather? Will virtual and hybrid remote students still have class, or will there be a true snow day? Well, here's the thing. Since they've given us the ability to do learning virtually and hybrid, and have that count. We want to make sure any bad weather days are still used as virtual learning days because that allows us to not have to use um, emergency days that we may need later that if we have to shut down or, or have anything like that. Um, so, you know, why some students are saying, yay, I don't have to go to school. Here's the thing, even if it's a, even if it's a bad weather day and Lake Erie's right over there and it's really warm right now, so I'm really hoping that we don't have a, a snow November or a snow October um, like we did a few years ago. But even if we do, the learning will be able to continue. So regular snow days won't be a regular snow day thing. Um, I think that covers everything. That the majority of questions there, I'll work on picking some more out. If you send any questions in um, to the forum, Frontier Forum at csd.org, that's specifically for the forum. If you have more reopening type questions, uh, please send them to the reopening committee. These questions I'll be working to add with our crew uh, to the FAQ, the frequently asked questions that are coming out. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, if you have individual questions, uh, a lot of them are very specific. Um, it's impossible to get to those here. Uh, the best place to do that is our building principles. Um, because they can address those those concerns specifically for your child or get the right person to do so. Um, but one thing I, I just want to say is it's, you know, to get school to open in September is, is taking an unbelievable team effort. Um, everybody is involved in making this happen. 80% um, of our parents want our kids back in school. And you know what? I want all of our kids back. I want all of our Falcons. I want to see them in the classrooms. I want to see what they're doing. Um, we all want to get back to our normal. And, and the stress that we're under because we're, it's not normal, that our lives have been turned upside down and we don't know answers to what's, what might happen or what's going to happen. But here's the thing. It's a team effort. If we stay working together as a team, even when we have disagreements, um, we'll be in a much, much, much better spot. It goes back to that Frontier Strong um, idea and um, there's no doubt this community is so so I thank you um, for being open and honest I, I thank you for your patience in the constant changes that we just can't keep up with um, it's it's going to be a different start of the school year it's going to be a different school year than anybody's ever seen but I have no doubt with the, the educators, the teachers that we have, the principals, the, the bus drivers, the food service, the aides, the secretaries, everybody here, the parents, community members, that we'll be able to make it happen. So on that note, I'm gonna tell you all to be safe, be well, and bleed blue. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks.